And I think about this group and um, <clears throat> our time together here in this uh, magical week or 10 days of traveling to uh, three of the most divine, spiritually enlightening places to visit on this planet Earth. What a, uh, what a real treasure it is, what a real honor it is uh, for all of us to be able as a group to go to these places. But you may think that you signed up for a program that you heard me speaking about um, perhaps uh, at a lecture, perhaps you saw it on the internet, <clears throat> perhaps someone else told you about it or you saw a flyer for it and, and you may think that you were the one deciding whether or not you should really do this, whether you could afford it, whether you could clear your calendar and have enough time to fit it all in, whatever. Um, but I have a very, very much of a, a different opinion about it. I have a deeper knowing about what we're all here to do. And I want to share that with you. Because um, one of the things that I have learned is that there is always something bigger moving the pieces around. Even when we think that we're, uh, we're the one who are making the, the choices. Carl Jung once said that at the same moment that you are uh, making choices in your life, you are also the spear carrier or the extra in a much larger drama. And he said, um, in effect, we are all doomed to make choices. You see the paradox. We're doomed. We're not doing anything. We're all just being done. And yet within that larger context of being done, we're also making choices. But it really boils down to a realization that who we are, who each and every one of us, our, our essence is, is not this body that we're in and these physical choices that we're making. I ask my audiences frequently, uh, how, many, how many bodies have you been in since you incarnated into this planet on this lifetime? Because um, one of the great teachers and sages of my life, a man named Muktananda uh, in India, was asked the question, what is real? Swami, what is real? And he said, um, that is real, which never changes. So anything that is changing doesn't meet the definition of being real. So who are you? What part of you meets that definition? Certainly not that body that you're in, We've all been in so many bodies since we showed up. We were all in a little body about this big that weighed seven or eight or nine pounds. And we were all in a body that was this big, a little toddler and a teenage body and a 20-year-old body. And for some, a body that has gone on, we've been in many bodies up and through the 70s and 80s, like myself, 71 years of age. Um, and if you think that body that you are in is real, then you must have thought that about your 10-year-old body as well. So I invite you to go out and bring that 10-year-old body in here and we'll talk to it. <laughs> and you smirk and laugh and so on because you realize that that's impossible because it's not real. It doesn't exist, does it? And the same is true of the body that you walked into this beautiful church here in Assisi tonight. It will be different when you walk out. You'll walk out of here with a different body than you walked in with. So that by that definition, this is all just an illusion. It's just constantly changing and therefore it isn't real. But there is a part of each and every one of us 
that can remember being in that 10-year-old body and that observed it and noticed it. And that you can close your eyes and be there. You can do everything you did when you were 10 or 12 or 20 or 30 or whatever. And so it is to that element of your consciousness, of your awareness, of your reality that I address this, these remarks. Not the body, not our physical possessions, but uh, our soul, our spirit, our divine mind, whatever we call it. It is, it is to that, that is the only thing that is real. And when we learn to live from there, from that, that place, I call it the higher place, the higher self or the highest self, the part of us that realizes that uh, all of us, you know, the poet T.S. Eliot said that we shall not cease from exploration, but at the end of all of our exploring, will be to return to the place from which we originated, but to know it for the first time. The poet spoke of death. I don't. I believe we can return to that place from which we originated. Uh, call it the Tao, call it God, call it soul, and come to know it. And as my awareness of uh, the man who uh, this city um, <clears throat> brought up and uh, is honored by his presence. Uh, he was actually known as uh, God's buffoon, God's fool. Wherever he would go, he would be mocked. And <clears throat> he was really trying to teach all of us to let go of our attachment to our possessions, to our bodies, to who we are. In fact, he believed that the only way you could get closer to God was to remove all of your, uh, all of your attachments to uh, your stuff, to what you own, and instead come from a place of uh, pure and divine love. And this gathering here for this miraculous journey that we're all on um, began as an idea. I think it was my idea, but I know that something bigger is always moving the pieces around. <laughs> and I'm always aware that uh, even though I think that uh, it's me making the choices, I also know that uh, uh, I'm also the spear carrier or the extra in a much, much larger drama. <laughs>